Hey there, welcome to the Eurostep Milwaukee Bucks podcast, proudly a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network and GSPN. I am one of your hosts, Ty Windish, joined as always by the on point Rohan Kadi. You're always on point, Rohan. How's it going, sir? Doing, doing well. Uh, it's been, a, it was a weird day for Wisconsin sports here on this Eurostep Tuesday. I mean, it was a weird day for Wisconsin sports on Monday as we record on this uh one off Eurostep Tuesday morning here. And we we just had the Bucks in action. We had the Packers in action at the same time. Were you dual were you dual screening? Uh for most of the games, yes. Yeah, same. That's for what I most of the too. games. Late I locked in on Bucks and then caught most of the end of the Packers, but I missed some of the ending. So which I, I saw the very end, unfortunately. What uh yeah, it was kind of a bizarre set of games. It really was. It just it was it was really really weird. If you want full analysis on that Packers unfortunate loss to the New York Giants, make sure you check out Talk of the Tundra. Link to that is on gspn.info. If you're watching on YouTube, it's on this feed. If you're on your podcast platform of choice, just search up Talk of the Tundra or like I mentioned earlier, gspn.info so you can get Newmark and Jordan's thoughts on that uh that Packers loss. Yeah, just make sure you're you're ready. Like, I feel like Bucks fans have been like in catastrophe about this season, but at least we didn't. The Bucks didn't lose to Tommy. Don't make my bed. Cutlets. I've been calling him Jay Cutlet, which I think is funny. I don't Jay think many other people Cutlet. think is that funny. Uh, but anyway, on the Bucks front, Milwaukee beat the Chicago Bulls another a second overtime game against the Bulls without Zach Levine this season, which. Not ideal. First, before we get to the Bucks side, do the Bulls just have Chicago, uh, Milwaukee's number this year? I, I I wouldn't say they have their number. It was just uh, it, it's just been a weird set of circumstances. I think this team is starting to play like a little together, it, and by this yeah. team, I mean the Bulls. Yeah. When without Zach Levine. And even though last time they didn't even have DeMar DeRozan, DeMar goes off for 41 in this game. It's just been a weird set of circumstances, but maybe they do have the Bucks number. I don't know. It sure seemed like they have. Um, it, it's interesting. But anyway, uh, the Bucks do, pers- do, do overcome. They win. What was the, I never remember the final scores. 133-129 One, in overtime. Yeah. Um, Giannis has a huge game as he often does against the Bulls 32 points, 12 rebounds, 6 assists Is but, that a huge game? I mean, it's a good game It's like average for him Well, yeah, but Giannis' average is a, a huge game Yeah, that's fair it, Overall, grand scheme, still a pretty huge game 6 assists, two, just 2 turnovers Nobody else on the Bucks had that huge of a game I mean, we'll get into some guys who played well But uh, Chris Middleton, 13 points on 11 shots Damian Lillard, 14 points on 17 shots, 3 for 17 in this game after starting 2 for 10 for the second straight game. Did not have a little uh, strong shooting spell like he did against the Pacers to kind of buoy that number. So I guess we can get into the main thrust of our conversation here, which really has a lot of layers. But you know, as the, the title of the pod is like, how can Adrian Griffin and the Bucks get Dame time back on schedule? I went with like some roll back the clocks to Dame time kind of ideas that really just didn't come together. But the same idea of, you know, does Dame need to be, I don't know, further integrated is the right word. Does he need to be, you know, do the Bucks need to cater a little bit more toward him? Obviously, we also have the report we can talk about from Chris Haynes after the Pacers game that we didn't know about when we were recording our postgame pod. But basically that Bobby Portis, for some reason, called out the Bucks for not funneling enough, like not calling enough clear late game offense, basically, which I'm, we'll talk about that too. And then I remember I'm trying to pull up the exact quote, but in, in Eric Names piece about the Damianis pick and roll, I know that Dame also said something. Um, he said, I, I think we just aren't in a lot of pick and rolls where I'm handling and he's setting. We haven't locked in on it enough. I think right now we don't get enough reps at it in the game. Uh, against the coverages because we don't run it all the time like you would assume so it's taking us some time to get it down so i do think i don't think dame is protesting i do think dame feels like he's not 
being properly used. And I think he's also not playing well on top of that over these last two games, the Pacers loss and, and this Bulls win. So let's let's have the Dame conversation because I do think it's front and center right now. I just said a lot of things, Rohan. Where do you want to start? I mean, it's doom and gloom, right? Teams over <laughs> seasons. Yep. Yep. They only have the second best record in the East, third in the standings because they're tied with Orlando, who is 1-0 against the Bucks. So it is pretty much a lost season at this point. Yeah, that's what I would assume. But uh, actually, actually being serious, I mean, it's it's difficult not to be a little bit concerned, especially considering what this Bucks team has been like over the past four or five years, as long as they've been good, as long as they've been contenders. Ever since Bud got there, uh, it's it's been a team that's sort of been in lockstep with each other. You don't really see a lot of a lot of weird comments being leaked uh being made by players about this team uh on this team uh towards coaching staff towards other players about like ski you don't you don't really see that the the biggest drama uh bucks have had is what thon maker and serge Ibaka's trade requests well is that i mean the the funniest thing we do have we have live video of pj tucker screaming at bud to change to adjust the defense in that net series it is yeah. not a new phenomenon for the players to want to adjust. How, we also, I mean, we had the, in year one, the Chris Bud thing came out about his usage yeah. offensively. I mean, it's not, these things do happen, I think, all, all over the league. I mean, LeBron throws some sort of fit every year, I think. It, yeah, I'm not, it, saying it's, it's, I'm not saying it's uncommon. Yeah. I'm saying it's like, it's, in and, and, and the case of the Bucks, like the P.J. Tucker thing, which is still so funny to this day. Every time I see that video, I'm just like, people really... I think just forgot how everything used to be. And also, I mean, Giannis after every playoff series where they lose usually would be like, well, coach didn't put me on the best guy. Yeah. It's I'm yeah. doing a bunch of shrugs with like a pouty lip for anyone who's not on, on the YouTube. Uh, the point I'm trying to say is like, it's not always on the record in, yeah. in, in like the athletic on Bleacher Report. Just on bleachers. Uh, oh, I yeah. guess we had no, t- Terry was me. in the athletic. Wasn't the Dame thing to Eric Nate? Yeah, the, what I said, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the Bobby thing was a bleacher report thing. Correct. Uh, you don't really see that is what I'm saying. So it's just – it's it's interesting. Obviously, there's a lot of new players. There's a there's a whole new coaching staff. There's, there's, there's a lot of factors at play here. So let me just start off by saying that in and of itself is interesting uh, for this for this Bucks team at this point in the season. And if we're if we're sticking with Dame right now, he's right. He's <laughs> he there in terms of like Dame Giannis pick and roll stuff. Like they they don't get a ton of reps at it. They don't realistically have a lot of time to really practice it. There's not a ton of uh, times where he's on the ball with Giannis as a screener. Now, here is where I would push back a little bit, is that he cannot expect to have the same amount of time as the ball handler in these situations as he did in Portland because he has a lot. He has a, he has a good team. He has an actual good team and players around him who know how to do things that are not him himself. So... While I do agree that it's not enough right now, it's never going to reach the same amount that it was in Portland. I agree with that too. Um, can we just can we just say the obvious part out loud? With Dame has a quote to the Athletic about this, and then Chris Haynes, pretty much known as a Dame guy, has this. He's also report. known as the Giannis guy. He is also, but Giannis after that game was like. We, we need to play better. I mean, it's like, well, I'm not going to put this on the coaches because they, they, he was actually asked a couple of questions that kind of tried to put him in that position and pretty much refused to take it. Um, he is, but I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I just, you know, connected some dots here. Bobby Portis also, shout out to Bobby who did media the next day and talked about that report and said the locker room is sacred, but I was just trying to be a leader. People always think of like the stars as leaders, but I've been in this league for 10 years. I've been on this team for a long time. I'm a leader too, which like fine. I think everyone kind of agreed they could be a little better with calling plays in those situations. Wasn't their biggest problem against Indiana. It just cost them the opportunity 
to claw back into a game after their defense wasn't good enough, their rebounding wasn't good enough, you know, et cetera. Uh, and then Chris's turnover basically threw the game away. But all, they've been mostly very good in clutch offense. They weren't very good against the Bulls also, but there's like multiple issues tying in here. One of them just like Dame slumped in, in both of these games. So I, I think some of it is just a slump. Like I don't think you can – I don't think there's a way you can get Dame 17 shots schematically where like your coaching is the reason he only hits three of them, right? Like that's – like clearly he's he's just not played his best ball the last two games. I, I think that's pretty much obvious. But I think it's related. Not just that he's not getting enough pick and I actually think the issue is they're not doing enough with him off the ball. Because some of it, it's the same issue we talked about after the Indiana game, where like Indiana wanted shots to funnel to Brooke Lopez and the Bucks did it. And Brooke Lopez took way too many jumpers in that game. I think teams, the Bulls, and I, I want to say too, but we're not going to talk about the Bulls a lot. The Bulls game, maybe the Bulls themselves, not. They play much better offensively without Levine. They're fighting defensively too. I mean, I think they deserve some credit. This isn't like some piss poor Bulls team. That, they're not the Pistons. No, and they're not the Bulls of like two months ago. I mean, they'd won four straight coming into this game. Like they're they're playing well right now. I, I do just want to say that. I'm not trying to make excuses, but I think that I've seen people be like, oh. The Bulls. The Bulls out rebounded the Bucks. The Bulls. Vucevic is good. Andre Drummond. That's like all, literally all he does. He just sits up there and plays volleyball with the with the with the hoop every couple times a game. Like it, they they're going to get rebounds anyway. Um, but the Bulls and the Pacers, like and pretty much every team, you can tell they don't want Dame to shoot. They crowd Dame. They get physical with Dame. Everything else. And I remember late in that game, which I hope is kind of an indicator of. Stuff we'll see against this Indiana rematch tomorrow on Wednesday. They ran a pin down where Giannis screened Dame's guy off the ball and he cut to the rim and dunked. And it was like, oh, they need to do that more. They, they need to like get Dame free off the ball more when teams are going to be this aggressive and have him cut or have him go around stuff because I think it's been very clear that teams and, – and that's kind of the thing with the Dame Giannis pick and roll too. They'll just send everyone in. And in this game, it doesn't hurt as much because the role players were playing well. But like against Indiana, a lot of the guys on the team were cold. And then that is the issue with over relying on the Damianis pick and roll is there's three guys all over that play. And then the ball gets kicked out and it's like, OK, Brooke Lopez is shooting again or someone is passing up a shot and driving right back into the defense. I think they need to work on, you know, getting their spacing back. It has felt like. The paint's been very crowded these last two games, but also they need to work on freeing up Dame in other ways besides just, okay, here's the ball, run another pick and roll, try to drive to the rim because he's getting beat up. And the last thing I'll say, he's not getting the calls he's looking for. I think he shot like six or seven free throws against Chicago. He's very ornery about this. You you can tell. Uh, And I get it. I mean, he's getting hit. He's not getting the whistle. For some reason, they're giving him the honest whistle, but... You know, he's bigger than he looks like on the court in real life, but he's still a pretty small human compared to most players. So that would help him as well if he started getting calls that he thinks he should get. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy that he, we have another player. The Bucks have another player where it's like, man, they're, they're just not getting enough calls. Like, it's like you got to There's you some gotta sort gotta of common denominator something. between these players who happen to play in Milwaukee. They're both they're both teammates of Thanasis. And now I'm just I'm remembering we're recording this kind of early in the morning. I'm just remembering I had some I had, I had a dream that somehow involved Thanasis calling me out about something. Wow, that would hurt. Yeah, that would hurt <laughs> you a lot. Wow, it'd be I bad. I'd be heartbroken. Brand. I would be heartbroken if he did that to you. Yeah, good luck. Luckily, it wasn't real life. Well, um, I did see something this morning from T.A. Oh, did you know? <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's like one, one thing on the – on you don't, you don't want to become over-reliant on the Giannis Dame pick and roll uh, because you, you can have an Indiana situation like you mentioned where the role players just don't have it. However, in a situation like this Bulls game where the role players do have it and only two of your guys who don't play, two of your nine guys who don't play uh, aren't in double figures, seven of your nine are uh, – when you have good games like this, it's it's easy to see. I think it was uh, I think it was Jake Reeds who pointed this out on Twitter. 
Uh, it was it was a great action where it was just a Giannis Dame pick and roll from the, like the from the wing, and then as the guy from the corner helps, uh, you have a, a a Brooke Lopez hammer screen for wide open Malik Beasley in the corner. So as Dame sees that guy collapse, it's like oh, Bees is going to be wide open here, and uh, he drains the three. It's just like yeah, once once you get that figured out, it's easy. Like you can't stop something like that. However, that does rely on guys like Malik Beasley making their shots. You're taking the ball out of your two best players' hands, relying on your role players. And that's honestly a lot of times where stars really falter or falter. I'll say their teams falter in the playoffs is the role players let them down. It's hopefully not going to be the same situation in Milwaukee because you have like three guys who are like more than capable offensive players, four guys and at some times. But you can get in these sort of situations. And it's just really going to depend on the ebbs and flows of who's making the shots or not. I mentioned this on our on our pod after the Pacers game with Jordan. And it was like, yeah, we, we were upset about Giannis passing up shots at the end of that game when it was close. And my, my logic was we would be praising Giannis for passing up these shots if his teammates were making them. But since they weren't making them, it's 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 the narrative is, oh, Giannis is being too passive. He's not scoring enough. But if the teammates make the shots, it's like, oh, look at him. He's a great creator. He's a great playmaker. It's so, so dependent on the other guys in these situations. Uh, so that's a long-winded way of saying uh, the Giannis Dame pick and roll will be unstoppable if everyone can hit their shots. Yeah, and I think it's worth noting um, Dame does have 18 assists – or excuse me, 16 assists over these last two games. So still has the offensive utility, still is spraying good passes all over the place, finding shooters, finding cutters, sometimes finding the role men, Giannis or Brooke, whoever it may be. Um, so it's not like that's gone away. Um, and clearly the offense is not like shying away from him shooting. I mean, 17 shots against the Pacers or 20 shots against the Pacers, 17 against the Bulls attempted um, plus six and seven free throws respectively in those games, just not knocking down enough of the shots. So that's where I think it would be beneficial to free him up off ball a little more. They're actually, he's actually on ball maybe too much now when he's on the court. I mean, except for these late game where like I, it, the kind of the report is like, F Chris Middleton in some respects because I feel like it's only a couple plays late in games when Dame's not all over the ball and it's because Chris is bringing the ball up and trying to run an action and it's just like no more of this which the way Chris dribbles I it looked like he was gonna have another horrible turnover against the Bulls thankfully it was I mean it was a foul I think the Indiana one there was some contact too but it's like oh Chris please you're not helping your case here Chris Maybe you shouldn't just bring the ball up anymore. Maybe we could bring bees down there to bring it up and then just give it to Dave and then we'll go from there. Um, oh, Chris, just dribbling, still not a not a strong suit for Chris. But he's done a lot of other things well. Uh, we'll talk about Chris and, and everyone else a little bit later. Um, on the Dame front, I want to circle back to the Haynes article. I, I specifically didn't want to pod tomorrow yesterday because I didn't want to just have nothing but this article to talk about. Because, I I mean, it's not ideal. We're not used to this kind of thing happening. But, like, Haynes went on a podcast or somewhere after and was kind of like, you know, it really wasn't, like, that big of a deal. It's it's more noteworthy that it was reported from Milwaukee than anything. And in the article itself, it says this. Um, So, basically, the context, if anyone didn't read this, which we shouldn't assume, you're all so terminally online, you immediately saw the Chris Haynes article about Bobby Portis. So Griffin sounds answered, like you're saying saying why are you why are you reading Chris Haynes? We love Chris. No, Haynes. it's not about Chris Haynes. I would have said that about any reporter. People live their lives. I'm very jealous. They're just I know. out in the I'm world without with without a, a service that hey ding your team's in turmoil ding like it's a weekend. People should enjoy their lives. Or it was Thursday, almost a weekend. Anyway, uh, after the game, Pacers win win the fourth quarter by twelve. Griffin entered the locker room and began harping on the importance of winning the rebounding battle, sources say. Which, again, like, they didn't box out Miles Turner after they forced a miss. So I think that's a good thing for him to be harping on. Uh, Portis, who scored four points on just five shots against Indiana. And Indi- Which is really funny. I know. <laughs> it was written that way. I know. It, it is pretty funny. In a near-season low 18 minutes. 
quickly interjected and stressed how essential it is for Griffin to structure the offense down the stretch of games, sources said. Which I, I still am just like, that's what Bobby was thinking about? Bobby is I like, mean, yeah. call more plays. I mean, I, I in fairness, in fairness, it looked like in in their post game comments too, like Dame and Giannis and Chris were all also like confused. So maybe that's what Bobby was talking about is him as a leader. It's not just stepping up about him in yeah. like his own personal game, but just as the team game overall, which is that is fair. But but th- what I find interesting though is, isn't this how they mostly operated with Bud too? Play random. Well, not even just that. Because I, I said this and I've, I've had people, I think Buck's film room was like, oh, play random is overblown. I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, we talked to Brad Fisher. We watched their offense. We watched Drew do whatever he wants. Like, they played uh, let the stars kind of read and react and flow into stuff offense, including Which in is, late games. This isn't new. So that's why I'm just so confused. It's, it's, that, also, it's also not new for NBA yeah. offense. <laughs> like, I, I like there, there's been this reaction like – like the Bud offense was this carefully scripted play calls every time up the floor. We know that. We want. Did we not all watch this? There's do you think film Bud of what you did. Drew Iso pull up three again. That's what Bud's calling in from the side. Ignore Giannis. Ignore Giannis. No, they they read and reacted. I mean that's that's very normal. So it's I, it's, it's how it, it, yeah exactly. It's very normal. It's how most teams operate. You're not just calling. This isn't college. Like, yeah. You, you well, trust people think, your people players. Think every, it's Hoosiers every play. Every play. It's or the NFL like Spider Y two banana and and the guys are like okay let's go break. I mean on that play itself, Chris was going to post up Giannis because Giannis was dominating the Pacers. Didn't like the pass that was there. So then went to swing it to Dame so Dame could run a Dame Brook pick and roll. Dame wasn't ready, didn't go to the ball, it got picked off. Like it, I, I, don't, I don't think it was even as disjointed as people say. I think there was no. like a, a disconnect between Chris and Dame that is as much on those guys just getting more reps together than anything. And it's it became, of course, because that's the way this team is reacted or covered as this coach couldn't even get a play call in. Can you I mean, believe this? I know. It's crazy. It's like what? Their fourth game, Giannis and – or not Giannis, Dame and Chris playing together in crunch time? Yeah. It's not It's not a very common occurrence. So, yeah, they're going to get their signals mixed up. Well, and, and Chris brings up the ball because Indiana is face guarding and damn near doubling Dame on the inbound. So, it's like all of this yeah. was, I think, very explainable. It didn't go their way. They could have used a play call in that situation, but it's not like some crazy thing around the league for it to not to be – Every single anyway, I, I yeah, just people are to like, say oh, that man, for A- Adrian Griffin went and sat down. It's like, yeah, maybe his legs hurt. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he sat down because he's probably, he's so used to this team just being like, don't even worry about this part, coach. We got you. And it's for almost once, like didn't. this is the it's almost like this is the number one crunch time clutch team in the NBA. Yeah, and they've been performing at a high level in these situations. So when there's a gaff, it's like, huh, that's weird. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so Portis did that. Uh, as one of the leaders of the team, Portis continued on voicing his concerns. Griffin welcomed the criticism and acknowledged he could do a better job being more aggressive with his play calling, sources say. The nine-year veteran, Portis, explained that it's a two-way street, direction is needed, and it's up to the players to execute, sources say. So I feel it, even in the report itself, it was like, you should call more late-game offense. Griffin was like... Okay. Yeah, probably. And Portis is like, yeah, we got to execute too. And it, I, I just love that the report is like late game explosion. It sounds like just a guy voices concerns and they talk through it and like agreed to move forward. And and, and I want to say too, and this reminds me of like going into that next game when, you know, they, they weren't dropping and it was bad and there were like the questions about Griffin. And after that Pacers game, it was the same deal, right? Of like, Oh, our knives out for Adrian Griffin. It, you know, it's the locker room. They started the Bulls game like playing hard, executing at a high level. The Bulls ended up getting back into it. But I think it is notable and maybe just a good – maybe it's just lucky. I don't know. It's been good. We haven't seen them like lay an egg when Griffin is kind of in this precarious spot publicly. People will say, oh, they went overtime with the Bulls. They kind of did. But like they didn't come out of that game or into that game. Like, ah, you know, we're checked out. You know, uh, we, we don't care. They came into that game playing really well. And then the kind of bench foible started when the deep bench got in, although the bench played kind of good at first. 
Bobby had a good scoring game uh, after these these guys fired him up apparently. But the rest of the bench, not so much. And, and again, Dame wasn't shooting good. The Bulls got back into it. But what, what's your thoughts on that idea of just like, I feel like they play well when their coach is under fire? I mean, it's probably not a good trend to like keep. Well, on the other hand, Tommy, the Discord pointed out, they'll never lose back-to-back games the way people talk about the Bucks when they lose if – they're going to respond every time that people talk about their coach. That's You know what? That's fair enough. So, I mean, I can deal with the discourse if they're going to not have a two-game losing streak all year. Yeah, they, they lose they a game. Have they not so the... far? No. I'm just saying. Uh, or maybe they have. I don't, I'm pretty sure they haven't. I can check as I'm talking. But it's... Yeah, it's 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 a weird situation to be in. Like, imagine they lose like they a did. playoff game. They oh, did. Wait, this That's is the... last year. This is last year. Come on. What are you doing, Ty? Come on. I blame B-ball ref. They did anyway. At Pacers, at Magic. Yep, they did. November 9th, November eleventh. Yep. Um. Yeah, I was like, yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, but it's. If the team is playing well when their coach is under fire, that's probably a good thing in general because it's like, yeah, they rally around their guy. Uh, so that that's a good thing. It's a bad thing that their coach is constantly under fire. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't even know though, how much of it is on him. No, it's it's not on him. It's not on him. But I'm saying 23 games into the season, we've had multiple instances of, oh, man, our, our guy's under fire. It's like. We're we're a quarter of the way through the season. Yeah. Well, it's, we, there's two ways to go from as, from the team perspective, though. It's do we rally players, around him, or yeah. do we? You know what? You guys are right. I, you know, I read Kevin O'Connor's. This is Giannis talking. I read Kevin O'Connor's piece in the Ringer, and I agree. Why doesn't he try out more? We only played zone for a full quarter. I wish he would try out more defenses. Yeah, I wish I wish stuff would change. I wish we would mix things up a little bit, you know. Uh, I've only seen like three, four different defenses in most of these games, which is really pathetic. Yeah, you should be using eight defenses if you're a good coach. Didn't you come from Toronto? <laughs> like, <laughs> you got to throw in a box and one in there. You got to roll out yeah. everything. You got to do why the we, two why three zone, the, the three two zone, the one 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 zone. Like, if you're not using four different zones, you're barely trying. <laughs> Why are we not deploying the barrier against Kobe White? <laughs> <laughs> they probably should the way he's played, man. Um, and then the other thing, KOC, always, why isn't Andre Jackson Jr. getting more burn? It's just like, I don't know. He's played pretty well, but so have some of the other guys. Yeah. My AJ Marjan Green's has finally good defensive played. game, and AJ yeah. Green's shots are falling. Yeah, the positive uh, shooting regression to the mean is here, baby. AJ Green's, he's lighting it up from distance. Was he four or five from... Uh, uh, downtown in that game last night. He also did an Andre Jackson where he just would not pass or would not shoot, excuse me, when he got inside the arc. He took one two pointer. Oh, yeah. But it was almost like he was forced to. Yeah. Uh, he had a wide open lane to the rim. He was like, you know what? I'm more comfortable. Uh, yeah. He should have <laughs> drove that. That was my probably only, that was my only ding on him for like the whole game, basically. I thought he played about as well as possible. That was the one possession where I was like, go to the rim and try to get fouled because. Obviously, you're a great free throw shooter, and that that's a net gain. But I get being a little leery of that. The Bulls have some size down low. But AJ Green, we can quickly twelve points, five rebounds, three assists. He's a nice passer, man. He really is. He throws dimes. I mean, the one to who was cutting down to the rim was that campaign. It was. That was a very nice find, and like took some patience. It was kind of like a drive, stop for a second, wait for that to develop, then throw the bounce pass. He had just is like a good passer in space. But yeah, four for five from deep, obviously plays. Also, like, continues to hold up pretty well defensively. Was that Kobe big White? Dude. Was that Kobe White where he pretty much stayed with him, but just barely fouled at the end to kind of get the uh to get into the line? I think so. Is that either him or Damar? I think it was Kobe on that one. I mean, Damar gets guys too, but AJ Green only had one foul in this game in his 13 minutes, which was strong. Um especially when he's the guy who's being targeted on defense. Oh yeah. Definitely. You know who else was good defensively in this game? Marjan Bochamp. I was going to say Chris, but yes. Chris? Late against DeMar, he was very good on defense. You disagree? Yeah, late against DeMar, he let him get dunks and shots to tie the game. How late? 
like the literal bucket that tied the game up for the Chicago Bulls. It was just him going up against Chris. In the fourth quarter? Yeah. DeMar was one for seven in that quarter. Yeah. So I'm I'll saying... take that if there's one. Okay, that's fair. And in OT, that that dunk to really uh, get get the Bulls, I think, back two within for four, three. Two for four in OT, so not as good. And it was just like, ooh. Uh, yeah, Chris provided zero resistance. So, like, DeMar literally went coast oh, to coast the one and in, dunked yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In OT. When Chris can't get set in front of a guy, it's curtains. But yeah. in the half court, when Chris was set in front of him, I thought he defended him very well. Yeah. DeMar DeRozan also had 41 points. Tomorrow was great in this game. So we were we're kind of I I'm trying to lean away from doing the oh man Aaron Neesmith was amazing as Giannis went off for forty something. That's points. fair. I mean I I don't think Chris was the primary on him most of the time. There was also he knocked down three of six threes, and I'm just like you can't do that. Why don't do that? You're not allowed to do that. You're God if you can hit those tomorrow. It's not fair. Demar, come to the Bucks. Please. Yeah, some teams are gonna trade for him like today. Like oh he's he's shooting them now. Okay. Come on over. The just, young guys just, brought him can the, can the Pistons trade for DeMar DeRozan and then buy him out? <laughs> <laughs> he might refuse to play there. That's a, like, can we make that happen somehow? DeMar just holds a press conference where he's like, this guy tried to make me marry his daughter too many times. I'm only been, weird. I only just got off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> They've been calling me the new Bojan, which I don't really get at all, and I don't, I don't appreciate. Oh man, it's uh, yeah. If Demar gets bought out, come to Milwaukee. It's not going to happen, but no, one can dream. Yeah, Demar had an awesome game. I mean, part of it is they just can't stop fouling him. And the funny thing, I think it was Marjan who we can talk about now. His his defense was very good, but one of his lap few lapses on that end was like Demar pump fakes. He doesn't jump. Demar pump fakes a second time, and Marjan jumps, and then Demar. It was his only foul. foul. The yeah. So both of the young guys, I thought, played a pretty dis- – the two young wings played a pretty disciplined game on the foul front. But DeMar gets to the line 12 times. That's the thing, like, actually only ended up shooting 14 of 30, which is 46%, which is good, but not, like, incredible. But adds 10 from the free throw line. And, again, some of those are threes, which is really weird for DeMar. I mean, six of, th- six of his 30 shots were threes, which isn't a lot – for pretty much anyone else besides like Giannis, but for him, that's a ton. It was weird to see him knock down his threes, but I did think Marjan played an all around very good defensive game. I can't unsee how well he like shows help now. Watch him off the ball on defense when the ball comes near his guy. He just does a very good job of like making the ball handler hesitate without giving up the open shot to his player. Like you can tell. He's been working on that. He's been watching film. He's been doing everything. I think it's very obvious he's been focusing on the defensive end for his improvement this season. Yeah, it's it's pretty clear. I think uh, I think it, it's really good that you pointed out the showing how because that's one thing this Bucks team has kind of struggled with in this season. Like also Chris, um, like there's that Patrick Williams put back dunk. He's just watching his guy. Yeah, he's in the corner. Just Got a come. box out. Yeah, so that's why I, I push back a little. On the on the Chris Middleton defensive stalwart take I just, that you're trying. I'm kidding. I just saw um, him have some good possessions on Demar late, and I think I think we have found his lane on defense. Yeah, just standing in the lane. No, it's like hard. <laughs> you you got to find like he's stout. He's big and he's stout, and like against a guy like Demar, that can really work in the half court. Demar was too fast and and transition, but just like put him in front of guys like that. Also, Demar is like thirty. Four? I mean, still, is he 30, a, yeah. Is he thirty-four? I don't think I don't know if he's that old. Let's not go ahead and say thirty. He's thirty-four years old. Wow! I'm, I'm so proud of myself. That's a good. Uh, I did not. The, wow, <laughs> man! It so him being that fast uh, is just amazing. I also don't think he's that fast. He's pretty fast. It's all right. I mean, knock on wood for his sake, but uh, DeMar has had a very healthy career. Yeah, he has. Dude, sh- clocks in, gets buckets, clocks out. Yeah. Again, come to Milwaukee, please. Take that take that Shohei contract with the Bucks next uh, next season. I <laughs> wish you could like, just defer it. Yeah, I wish you could just completely manipulate the salary cap. Yeah, I don't know what's... It doesn't seem like... Well, I guess they don't have a salary cap and that it really shows in this instance that they don't. 
or luxury tax. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Manipulate stuff. all of it. Yeah. Um, well, that's, it? that's kind of what they did with Bobby and what they're trying to do with bees right now too, I'm sure. Yeah. That's fair. That is fair. <laughs> Just um, one more year of Batman bees and then we got We got you. Wink, wink, we got hint. Or the – what is it? The what, Is it a one, 175 or 150%? You can oh, yeah, them. they can do – like, yeah, but it might end up just being vet men again if the cap uh, raises. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But, yeah, I just – I credit to Shohei Otani for the optimism that we will have a functioning society in 2043. Yeah. No interest. I was like, come on. No just interest. The Dodgers. No, I, think, I think the interest is built into the $700 million. I saw some, like, MLB uh, – salary guy tweeting about this well i i I saw that there's maybe that's that's fair but for the deferred part like he's not getting additional that was reported that there's no interest i think i think without the interest it's like a 440 million dollar deal or something Mm. i don't understand anything about people always say to me oh the basketball cap is so complicated i'm like it's have you looked at football or baseball? Have you looked at the NFL? The NFL, I, that's the one <laughs> what, where I'm just like, what's a what's a void year? Did you, did you watch? Uh, did you watch Parks and Rec? Yeah. Do you know like the cones of Dunshire game or whatever? Yeah. That that's how I I I feel like I'm watching a game of that when NFL cap guys are like, well, they extend his contract by two years, but it's actually six years with the void years. But if they cut him midway through this year, it won't count against the cap, but they will have to pay it. But then if they wait an extra two weeks, then it's triple the amount and it's going to take 10 years. I'm just like, huh? And then they have to roll three eight-sided die. And if the result is more than 24, then they can waive that cap, cap hit. Yeah, it's <laughs> Cones of Dunshire is a good pull. Uh, I, I it's saw like, a TikTok the other day where they like played the game and it was so funny. It's I forget <laughs> the actor, but Ben has to play it against someone. It's a very, very funny scene. Uh, it's Adam Scott. No, I forget who he had to play against. Oh, oh okay. it was like a it was a, an actor. I re- oh, it was um the guy from Workaholics. You never watched Workaholics? No. Oh, not Durs and not. I forget the guy's name. Anyway. But yeah, Shohei Otani, like 68 mil a year when you're not like probably not playing anymore is crazy. Yeah. It's just crazy. Can you imagine if some team trades for him in like five years? Well, that's the thing. These guys rarely get traded for that reason, right? I mean, it's got to be like pretty much impossible to move that that cap hit. It, it's got to be because then a team is stuck paying him 68 68- <laughs> really yeah. here <laughs> well all, all these guys that sign these like like i i have a giants fan friend who's always like trying to trade for christian yelich it's just like is that even possible i think no i think it is but it's like if a team trades for him after he's done like after this 10-year deal is done you still and he's not contractually obligated to p- play for your team anymore you're paying him 68 million dollars yeah. it's crazy that's got to be pretty much just like not a non. He's re- he's retiring a Dodger. Yeah, it's like no team is going to trade for that. Yeah, which is probably a, a one reason that he wanted to sign him. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's I like an implicit. Be- he probably has a no trade too because baseball probably. really has those. But anyway, let's get enough Shohei. Congrats to Shohei Otani for breaking uh, breaking Canada's heart, which he, we always support. Oh yeah, we do. But it's like it's also like if he renounces his like U.S. citizenship at the end of the contract, he's not taxed on it. Oh, you're obsessed with this deal. It's crazy. It's <laughs> absolutely an insane contract. Yeah. Like, it's so fascinating to me. He's making two, he's making less than Malik Beasley for the next like 10 years. Yeah. And he's like, making less money than Thanasis for the next 10 years. It is insane that, that he still got this. Even though he just like had Tommy John and can't, he probably is like a, a DH for at least one year, and they were still. Oh, no, like, he's yeah. only one of the best hitters in baseball. <laughs> but I mean, one of the best hitters in baseball does not get seven hundred million ten year contracts. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, that's like insane leverage. I wondered if the market would dry up a little bit. Him and his agents made sure it did not. Yeah. Did crazy. you see Tommy DeVito's agent? It's got to be a bit, right? It I don't know. Be- I actually think it's not. It's got to be a bit. It's got to be a bit. I can't. I, I tweeted this after the game. I, I, I cannot. I, I boosted it. It's like we. What 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 happened to when quarterbacks said aura? 
Now we have ones where it's like they put the mayo in the coffee. Still do. The good they ones still have aura. Bed, and they're winning in prime time. Oh, actually, I shouldn't say it because Mahomes' aura has been very weak lately. It has. Who's the only quarterback with Burrow. like aura now? Burrow is Burrow injured. definitely. But, but when he's playing, Burrow definitely Lamar? Has. Yeah. Like who, who else? A Josh Allen has on field Favre aura for sure. Yeah. Just a country boy slinging it. <laughs> Indeed. Hopefully uh, only the football. Yeah. Let's say only the football part of it. Um, back to the Bucks. I, yeah, I, I was did this. Say, back I did to this. The, what were we even talking about? I don't remember. Oh, Marjan's defense. Marjan had another pretty nice game. Uh, here's, I, I will say I, I want to raise a gripe with Coach Griffin. Oh, okay. I've got one. I've really only got one. There's like, that I was really just like, oh, that's dumb by Griff. I don't, not dumb, but I, I just don't agree with it. Let's just scale back the Cameron Payne. There's just too much Cameron Payne for my taste. And I think the way that Marjan and to a uh, pretty equal extent over the course of the year in totality, Andre Jackson Jr. have played. I would rather just see one of those guys than campaign most of the time and let the vets on the team handle the ball more. And maybe, I'm not saying you never play Cameron Payne, but Bobby plays nearly 25 minutes off the bench, had a, very, a good game, 17 points, 7 rebounds, didn't defend very well. But then campaign at 18 minutes was the next most off the bench. I just feel like there's a lot of Cameron Payne personally, and I would I could do with a little less. And I think that would help the defense too. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think that's fair to have a little uh a little less Cameron Payne action uh in in the in in the in the life of the Milwaukee Bucks. I mean, it's do you, do you want to go with Andre Jackson Jr. instead then in these situations? I mean, in this game just like swap him and Marjan's minutes. 18 for Marjan, 14 for Cameron Payne. Yeah, it's it you have to have a lot of Cameron Payne, not a lot, but you have to have some Cameron Payne because Dame just plays the entire first quarter. Yeah, well, that's right. So, I mean, but Dame, Dame ends up playing uh, nearly forty-one minutes, so that in a, means in a in a fifty-three minute game. But still, there's still overlap. I, I I would just want to cut back on the Dame campaign overlap minutes, which I no, that's tough that is fair because campaign is fair. then doesn't just doesn't get that many minutes. It can be hard to be in rhythm, and, he, and not that he had a bad game in this game. He's two for four, hit one of his two threes, had five assists. Like he has his good games, but I think defensively it just gets tough with him. And I'd rather see more wings, especially with Dame. And again, this is like a lot of the defensive stuff in general. Like when your starters, two of your four starters on the perimeter are Dame and Chris, it's just not going to be easy to build a great defense with those guys. As much as I praise Chris for, I think, some good possessions on DeMar earlier. Rohan said that's BS. He sucks. But um, it's just – it's tough. It's it's hard to match up with teams who have perimeter juice. And like Kobe White, who's been playing well, took advantage. DeMar DeRozan also took advantage. So – Can always go higher on those Bucks point guards – or opposing point guards, excuse me. Exactly. Uh, yeah, you have not been able to go uh, higher on the Bucks point guards lately, but I think that will change pretty soon here, hopefully by Wednesday. Um, but that's like that's my one gripe is it's probably just too much campaign um, Dame. But also like most of the time, Payne has played pretty well this season. The duds really stink, but it's also just built in like they're over relying on these guys who should be deeper on the bench right now besides Bobby because they're still missing Crowder and Connaughton. Sounds like Pat could be back next week and – we're only a couple of weeks out from the uh, of a hopeful Crowder return as well, which is a a big development for this Bucks team. It's I cannot overstate how much Bossman nine nine is probably needed for this team. Oh yeah, because like I'll 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 take it. my when we did our preview pod with Adam and Jordan, I was like Bossman's going to be the X factor this year. Bossman's going to be the X factor this year. Because you see all of these, all of the, again, I'm going to try my best to do what you do and not just constantly use Twitter discourse as a way of talking about the game of basketball. I just, I'm, I'm watching the game more. I'm watching what people are saying. I've been, I walked away from the game last night and I was just like, yeah, Dan played pretty bad and they won. Scrappy Bulls team. That's fine. You go online. It's just like, this can't, this isn't okay. This can't keep happening. And it's like, what is this like a, 
it's like a film noir. This feels like Batman dialogue. They won a basketball game. I okay. You won the battle, but are you gonna win the war? We're going downhill rapidly. It's like Jesus. We're on a roller coaster. Is this politics or Bucks Twitter? I can't tell. Oh man. It's just it's just Twitter, which yeah. is just it's every every field. Uh <laughs> What was I even going to say? Oh yeah, there's a lot. I've, I've seen a lot of people uh, collaborate for for a reunion with uh, the aforementioned PJ Tucker. Oh yeah, and it's like, boss man does all these things, but actually good. It, he does offense, which is a big a big change from PJ. Um, yeah, I mean, I've said I would like him on a buyout if there was an open roster spot, but honestly, I don't know if I would because I don't think there's minutes for him, and then. He's just in the same situation again. Yeah, but then he's in that situation in Milwaukee and all the good vibes are there. Are there enough good vibes to sustain an angry P.J. Tucker right now? I don't know if there are. (laughs) That's fair. I wonder if he still has his place here. I would guess no. It's been a couple of years now. It has been a couple of years. Um, It's been a good market. I would imagine there's been a good time to let that thing go by now. Which is not what he's ever said on the court when he's holding the basketball, apparently. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a good time to let this thing go. I guess on a pass, he said it. I I just think, like, I don't know what he's providing better than Marjan or Andre Jackson, much less uh, uh, Boss Man, man, who certainly is is much better. Would you rather have PJ Tucker or Cameron Payne? Cameron Payne. Yeah, he's doing more for your bat. He he doesn't do maybe what you need all the time, but he's doing more for your basketball team. Imagine PJ Tucker being the backup point guard. What is PJ? Thirty? Is he thirty eight? Thirty seven? Thirty eight sounds right. He's from the two thousand thirty eight. Thirty nine in five NBA draft. The uh, two thousand six. Two thousand six. But didn't okay. debut right away. So that's why I think why people sometimes think he's younger because he went and played overseas. Or maybe he played like one year and then left for I don't Yeah, know. then he went overseas and then he yeah. came back. Thirty eight years old. And it's just like people are like, Oh, I think PJ has lost some lateral quickness. Yeah, he's thirty eight. <laughs> of course he has. But that's that makes it tough, right? I mean, it's like do we need another guy who's not very quick, who's probably not gonna be great in transition, and who's also gonna go up the offense? I mean, just realistically, no. And the buyout thing with him, I, I kept forgetting he has a player option next year. Oh, so he can't even can't even do you it. You could like he could decline it, but he shouldn't. He's not going to make he? that back. Yeah, and you know I, I think and I think we'll probably have to do a trade pod fairly soon because the other thing is like they have too many wings to play them all when guys get healthy, and could they maybe flip a couple players with a certain skill set who can maybe defend. And do something offensively and be better off, probably. It's it's going to be some tough combos to be had. I think the Bucks will be very active, as they always are. But, like, I mean, I, I don't think P.J. will get bought out. And we'll talk trades, but I, I certainly wouldn't trade Bobby or Pat. And it would take one of those two guys for P.J. Tucker at all. Not even yeah. close. So I don't think it's happening, um, unfortunately, for, for P.J. No. I mean, maybe we should just see more Robin Lopez in the lineup. We'll get the same thing. Is he still sitting at two minutes? Or did he play in a blowout against the Knicks? I think he played against the Knicks. He played against the Knicks. He he shot a three that prevented the oh, Bucks from right. having the best scoring, like best three point shooting game of all time, or something. No, it was uh, they would have scored one fifty for only like the sixth time in franchise history. No, I think it was also like they would have had twenty or more made threes on sixty five percent shooting from oh, three, which right, has right, never right. been done before. Classic Robin Lopez. Yeah, let's see. But if he hit it to have them do that, and he he hit the tee, it would have been amazing. I need a Robin Lopez three this season. Oh, he's played in four games this year. Yeah, do he's played many- in. Sh- do you know how many points he has? Probably like two. You are correct on zero made shots. Oh, he hit some free throws. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. He is 0 for 1 from the field with two made free throws, one assist, one turnover, no rebounds. Not the Robin Lopez stats you would expect. I think it is the Robin Lopez stats you would expect <laughs> okay. from a general standpoint. Fair. Uh, Malik Beasley, 
Seven for 11 from the field to get Chicago. Five for eight from deep. Four uh, rebounds, two assists, one steal. One of my takeaways from that Indiana game was like they did not get him involved enough early. And it felt like they were seeking out bees more throughout this game. He's just like a very good offensive player. And I know he's streaky. He's going to have bad games. But if you can ascertain that he's on, it is worth funneling shots to him. Because he's never going to get the first or even second usually best perimeter defender. And he'll just beat guys. I mean, he had a couple nice finishes. Like one of the A.J. Green, I don't know if he got an assist for this or not. But he went and found bees kind of on the move. And instead of shooting, Beasley just like took it all the way to the rack and finished. We've seen that from him too. I mean, obviously the main focus is going to be making sure Dame is properly utilized. But in this game, they got Bees the touches that I think he has pretty much earned at this point. And and again, like when he's on, they're very hard to beat. And even in this game, when Dame was decidedly off, they end up winning because Beasley was able to do enough to help the offense get through it. He's tied for second on the lead in scoring in this game, which is pretty impressive. It, it was very impressive. I mean, he's he's putting up monster numbers as of late. He's on a tear. Yeah. This is the one thing with Malik Beasley is he will find his own shot and he will be a streaky player. The highs are there. It's the lows that are uh, kind of low. But we haven't really seen that with the Bucks. Not so much. Far. He's been in a good rhythm. And again, it's only been 23 games. But that's a solid sample at this point. Like 23 games is a... Is a is a significant portion of the season. You wouldn't, uh, I'd, I'd still say like you, you want to get to like, I don't know, 50 or 60% of the season before you can actually make like firm assumptions about the team. But I think you should tell that to, uh, many, many people. That's why it's why I said it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Malik Beasley has just been, he's been on a shooting tear and when he is hot, when he knows he's hot, He's putting that thing up. Oh yeah, and and, and no uh, his teammates are, are are finding him, and it's it's good. He's one of those guys who like if he's he's not J.R. Smith, right? Like, can you imagine if this was if he was prime J.R. Smith? That'd be amazing. Dude, the dunks. But, oh my god, he had he he dunked on a transition leak out uh, in the game against the Bulls. Amazing, but like prime J.R. Smith was an animal. Yeah. If 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 you if you youngins out there are, are uh, unaware, you saying that is crazy. It's crazy, but I can say it in sure. this regard, which is crazy. If you youngins out there don't know what Jr. Smith used to do, just just look it up on YouTube, and then subscribe here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Malik Beasley, he won't he won't just take a million shots if he's not on. He's not one of those players. He he's not going to shoot himself into a rhythm. But if he's in a rhythm, he will milk that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, credit to him. He's he's played quite well. I want to kind of preview the the Indiana game, see if the Bucks can get some revenge. But first, Rohan, let's talk about our friends at Sleeper. So we have loved playing Sleeper this season, daily fantasy, right there in the Sleeper app. You may already have it if you're playing in a fantasy football or basketball league. They also have their daily fantasy contests, which are a lot of fun. And we are going to talk about some of our picks recently. Rohan, of course, who has crushed it all season on these projections, has a winning slate to talk about and then i can share my near miss also from from monday night's games so i made these uh these uh these picks right at the end of the first quarter you which is a, the, uh, the live picks you're a big fan of that i do love the live picks which is why uh happy to use sleeper because you are you can do these live picks throughout the game uh so it was uh at the end of the first quarter one projection was for brooke lopez his uh it, it was the, the the projection was 28 and a half combined points, rebounds and assists. I went I I, I didn't think he was really going to get there. So I choose uh, I chose to go less than that. Uh, and uh, he ended up with 25 combined points, rebounds and assists. And because the game went to overtime and he was on the court during overtime and I was sweating that one. And I was like, ooh. Ooh, and I, I, I made that pick because I did not think that Brook was going to necessarily be as involved in the second half because, uh, there was just a lot of there was a lot of uh guys at the rim for Chicago. They were loading up at the rim, so it was like, oh, if there's one guy who's going to break through that, it's Giannis, not going to be Brook. 
And uh, Brooke wasn't having his best uh, actual getting rebounds game. He was doing his normal boxing out. But yeah, that one that one made me uh, a little nervous, a little nervous. Um, Next one, the projection for Bobby Portis, his points was 14 and a half after he had 11 points in the first quarter. I was like, that's a gimme. They they went big on the second half Bobby theorem, and it honestly ended up being a little close. He had he had eight wanted. points, eight points at the end of the first quarter. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, this is gonna happen, and it did fairly quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he ended up with seventeen points. He didn't go too much over, like no, yeah, too much more. But uh, it w- it was a good one for that. And this one was probably my riskiest uh, pick, uh, Nikola Vucevic. Uh, the projection was at four and a half assists. He had two at the end of the first quarter. I was like, you know what? You know what? Vooch is a Bucks killer. He's going to make it happen. One and he more did per make quarter. it happen. One more per quarter. Rohan said, I see it happening. And, it and he did get that one more per quarter because he ended with five assists. So did that he do one it was before a... overtime. Yes. Oh, nice. That feels bad. Which is why overtime made me a little nervous because I was like, oh, man, Brooks yeah. going to cost me here. Uh, and at the end of the day, if Brook if Brook is doing well, I'm also happy. And if this ticket wins, I'm happy. So it's like you know, I'm, I'm good either way. Yeah. But, and then of uh, course, Kobe White. The gimme. The points. gimme. Yeah. It, it was it was a gimme. Kobe White had nine points at the end of the first quarter. The projection was twenty two and a half points. I was like, he's gonna he's gonna smash that into oblivion. Yeah. And uh, he ended up with thirty three points. I was like, that's that's too easy. That's too easy. Yeah, we were on the same wavelength. Mine starts with uh, before game. I got. The projection was below 20, so I was like, yeah, definitely, definitely more than that, and it happened. I also was sweating out a Vucevic production, the double-doubles. I think he ended with like 14 and 10. Actually, like, props to Brook Lopez. Not a very good Vucevic game overall, um, but so, but he did get the double-double. Giannis, 32 and a half, I think it was, points, yep. and he ends with 32, and it's I was tough. just like, oh, I wasn't as mad because I also I made this a cross sport game, which you can do. So I included Jordan Love, and I don't know why. I mean, I don't think many Jordan Loves would have hit in this game, unfortunately. The more thans at least, but I was like nine point five rushing yards. He's usually got like ten. I've seen him to really just get out of the pocket one time and just have some open field, and this is very doable. Jordan Love only had two rushing yards, so it wasn't all that close. But Giannis was was pretty close with the. Half a point uh, lower than, but that's the way she goes sometimes. You can't be too mad, especially when Rohan and I use promo code Eurostep to get a 100% match on our first deposit up to $100. So please download the Sleeper app, use code Eurostep, double your first deposit, play Daily Fantasy, now live in dozens of states, crucially, including Wisconsin. So check out Sleeper, play with us today. All right, Rohan. Bucks Pacers round three. I want to just have a quick combo. What are you looking for from this game? Besides, obviously, we'd like the Bucks to win and play a good game. But really, the two Indiana games, although one was so focused on because it was the IST semis, kind of similar formats, like back and forth game early. Seems like the Bucks in the second half figure something out. And then late, Tyrese Halliburton and the Pacers just overwhelm Milwaukee. So real quick, this isn't obviously a full preview pod. What are you looking forward to in this game? I'm looking forward to see how they handle the Tyrese Halliburton matchup because one thing that the Bucs have done a pretty decent job of in these two games is limiting Halliburton's scoring. He's not just exploding for like 40, 40 plus points each each matchup. Like we know he's capable of doing. What he's killing the Bucs in with is, is his playmaking. Just his his ability to dish the ball, his ability to set up other guys and just get get them going when the when the Bucks have to go and put a send two to him because they don't really have the personnel. Tyrese Halliburton is a weird player. He's he's a really big point guard, and uh, the Bucks just don't have a, a a a guy to send at him this year. In years past, it would have been Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday plays for the Boston Celtics now. You're not going to put Damian Lillard on him. It's, so it's it's Malik Beasley time, or it's Chris Middleton time. Uh, Chris Middleton would be uh, food yeah, uh, not... against against Tyrese Halliburton, but those are your options, right? Yeah. Those are realistically your options, because otherwise you have to go to a guy like Ajax. Or Marjan. Or Marjan, or 
hopefully like soon not not in this matchup obviously yeah. it'd be boss man boss man would probably try his best on that assignment but the bucks just don't really have a guy to really cover Tyrese Halliburton leading them to send multiple guys at him which opens up the floor for the rest of the the running gunning Indiana Pacers and that's just not what you want to do against this Pacers team yeah is just is let them create advantages because they're so quick they're so fast that any sort of advantage that's created, they're going to exploit immediately because they are such a good offensive team. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing I want to see in this game against the Pacers is an absolute scoring outburst. Yeah. This is a bad defensive team, the well, Pacers. They, they just gave up like 128 or something to the Pistons? It's The Detroit it's, Pistons? The Detroit Pistons who have lost 20 games in a row. Who do you think should have a longer losing streak? Them or the Spurs who are at 17, I believe, right now. Who has the longest winning streak? Who will have the longest losing streak this oh, year? Oh, they play each other in January. So yeah, that could. Be, I, I don't. Mean, they, they could also start new streaks if one wins that game. Well, I guess well, one, one, one one probably one has, has to. to win that game. First time my, in NBA history. I I want that game to just be like gets to overtime with like a score of like one hundred and one to one hundred and one, yeah. and then no one makes a shot. Uh, it's again. totally possible. No one makes a shot again. It just goes into second OT, third OT, fourth OT. And it's like, it's basically like, it's like golden goal, but it's in basketball. It's like, for, like first one to score just wins. And yeah. then they just can't score. It's like 4 a.m. where they're still waiting for Jaden Ivey. Everyone else is fouled out of the game. What happened? Is there a way? You can, you can bring guys back in. You can? Yeah. Really? Yeah. If too many How? guys foul out, they, you can bring someone back in. I'm pretty positive. That's amazing. Okay, I was gonna say, can I break basketball? Like I've yeah, broken you, uh, baseball. Let's let's move. We don't. We're, we're wrapping. <laughs> we don't have time for you breaking baseball. Uh, I, for the Bucks side of things, I will signal out one player. It would be huge to have a big Bobby Portis game, and I will tell you why. The Bucks just don't have many good options to close small right now, and it seems like Griffin does not like to close smaller than two of. Bobby Brook Giannis on the court, which I mean, Giannis is going to be there in crunch time. So he doesn't like to not have one of Bobby or Brook. I think the reason is since the boss man injury, there's not really a really good stretch four who can help with your rebounding and your big defense. So we've seen Chris not box out. He has some big rebounding games, but does not always give you that physical effort on the glass that a crowder could. So if Bobby can play well offensively and earn some more minutes, he could be an option to close. Brooke Lopez has just really struggled in this matchup. And the problem with Indiana is everyone is so involved. I don't think the Bucs can do what they've done in other games and like put Brooks somewhere else and put Giannis on the stretch five to contain them, which they did against Vucevic. I, I just worry like, you know, you put Brooke on Obi Toppin. I just think they're going to bring Obi Toppin into the actions too. So it's, it's tough for Brooke in this matchup. Bobby having a really nice game would be huge. But also agree with your point on offense. Like if Dame has a great game, I think they can not. I think easily... Dame, I think Dame needs a big game. I think he, Dame he needs definitely a big game. does. He definitely. Oh yeah. Does. After, after the last two performances where they're kind of stinkers, like you're yeah. Damien freaking Lillard. Like yeah, you you need this. I agree. It would be a good time to get it too, and I think this would be if they can get a good win against the Pacers. That would go a long way toward putting all this stuff from last week firmly in the rear view moving forward with one of the best records in the East and another convincing win against a good team. I think we can call even though their defense stinks. I think we can call Indiana such. Um, yeah, the, the IST runner-ups. Yes. And uh, Malik Beasley, I thought, one last note, pretty good defensive game against Chicago. Had a nice steal on a trap with Bobby. That ended up being a fast break bucket. He's always going to get beat sometimes, but I do think – He's gotten a little better than where he started defensively. It'll be a yeah. big game for all the Bucks promoted defenders, but it will be a big game for him defensively. I think it's I think it's very uh also fair that uh fair fair to give context that Ayo Desunu, who was uh his primary cover, just had one of the biggest cardio games of all time. Yeah. Uh, to to those unaware, it's just when you run and scores <laughs> like do nothing. Like he had zero points, he had zero free throws, he had zero rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks, zero turnovers. Well, I guess that's good for him. He had a foul, but you, when you when you just have zeros across the board, uh, it's it's just called a cardio game. Uh, I think uh, I think he has the fourth uh, fourth like uh, biggest cardio game in terms of amount of minutes. He played twenty six minutes, twenty nine seconds. But does it not count if you take shots? 
No, I think I think I thought you I had to not counts. take uh, uh, for it to be a Snell. I think you don't you can't. Oh, take for shots. a Snell you can't. For yeah, but Snell, just a cardio you can't. game yeah, in for general. A cardio game. Yeah, yeah, you just can't. You just hit, you can take shots. You just can't. Score. Have you had like the four trillion? Do you know about that? Yeah. It's like minutes, but then nothing. So this wouldn't be a trillion game either. It would have been the biggest probably ever. What like twenty three trillion? Yeah, twenty six. Man's like putting 26. up U.S. national debt games. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, Malik Beasley. Just if you, if you can do a little bit on Tyree Salibert, just a bit, that'd be great. It, it'll be interesting if they can keep Buddy Heald bottled up too. He had two really bad shooting games against the Bucks. I don't know if that will last, but uh, they have put an emphasis on not letting guys kill them from three off ball, which has been good. They just need to work on on ball a lot more. For sure, for sure. But uh, we'll be looking forward to that matchup on Wednesday. It'll be fun. Hopefully, the Bucks win that game. But uh, we'll we'll wrap this up. Say thank you for listening to this episode of the Eurostep here on Blue Wire and GSP. And make sure you check out gspn.info oh, for links. Can I, to can all I break your brain quick? I know we have to. Yeah. Go. Have you seen Kevin Pelton's uh, Eastern Conference All Stars starting five? No. Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, Giannis, um, someone else who made sense. I forget who the fourth was, and then his fifth starter. Oh, it was Scotty Barnes. Scotty wasn't Barnes. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no insane. Celtics starting would be pretty Okay, go on. Absolutely. Yeah, anytime, you, anytime you can put Scotty Barnes over Jason Tatum in an all star game, you it's have just to. Just like, do it. whoa, Tyrese Halliburton is the other one. So, like, four, I think I, I wanted to push back on Max. He's had a great year. Scotty Barnes there is wild, dude. Wild. I don't know. It's like the Vorps like, and you doing Schnorps there? are talking. <laughs> Yeah, if that's if your model predicts that your model's flawed. Yeah, I mean you need to you need to make some adjustments. There. We love to bash the Celtics, but best record in the conference. Tatum's been very good again. I don't, I don't, I don't understand it's, that it's, one. It's <laughs> just like it's it's Tatum for sure. But yeah, yeah, check out gspn.info for all of our links. Make sure you are subscribed to wherever you are listening to this or watching this or podcast platform of choice and YouTube respectively. Uh, make sure you engage in the comment section. Leave a five-star rating and review on your podcast platform of choice, Pod Random, and we will talk to you next time.